Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During today's Q&A session, if you'd like to ask a question, you may press star then 1. Today's call is also being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now let's turn today's meeting over to your host, Ms. Stephanie Sherholt. Ma'am, you may begin. Yes, thank you. Welcome to our news conference to discuss the agency's commercial crew transportation capability contracts just announced at a NASA television conference. My name is Stephanie Shearholtz from NASA's Office of Communications. Joining us today is Commercial Crew Program Manager, Kathy Leaders. We'll get started shortly, but a couple of operational notes first. Your phones are on mute now. To get into the queue to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone. Uh, about one hour after we conclude this teleconference, you can listen to a replay until October 15th by dialing toll-free 866-385-0194. The passcode for that replay is CREW, which is 2739. Again, the phone number for the replay is 866-385-0194, and the passcode is CREW. That's the number 2739. When uh, we enter Q&A, the operator will call on you and open and close your mic so you can ask your question. Please remember to stick to one question per news organization and identify to whom. I, 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 obviously, your questions are going to Kathy. Um, if we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. All right, I'll pass it over to you, Kathy. So I just have a few words to start off today with, give you guys a little bit more information. And, and first of all, I'd like to start off by thanking my team and the Commercial Crew Program and, and the eight aerospace industry partners we have worked with throughout the past four and a half years. Um, when you think about where we started in 2010, first with the basic systems and the subsystems necessary for human spaceflight, and then moving to spacecraft and launch vehicle development in 2011, before moving into the development of fully integrated systems in 2012, it's really amazing to know just how much has been accomplished in such a short period of time. So now we're getting to the real exciting part. Um, the final development of the systems, the smoke and fire testing, the manufacturing, the flight testing, the certification of safety, and then crewed missions to the International Space Station. So I imagine most of you turned in or tuned in to our news conference and would like to hear more about the contracts and NASA's role moving forward. So I'm going to give you a little bit more specific information about uh, the content of the contracts. So Boeing and SpaceX are responsible for completing the design, development, testing, and, and evaluation and certification of their systems. And under the two contracts, NASA will assess and evaluate how their systems meet NASA's safety and performance requirements. So here are a few more details about the incremental approach NASA will use to certify these systems. The certification baseline review is the first required milestone in this phase certification process. The review details the current design of Boeing and SpaceX's systems and identifies system requirements necessary to meet NASA's safety and performance requirements. The review will also outline their plans, schedules, and remaining work leading to NASA certification. During the International Space Station Design Certification Review, each of the companies will demonstrate how their integrated system design meets NASA's safety and performance requirements. And this will allow us to assess the design for crew safety prior to their crewed flight test. A flight test readiness review will demonstrate the company's readiness to perform their flight test. It will be required prior to the mandatory crewed flight test to the International Space Station with at least one NASA crew member on board. The operational readiness review will demonstrate that the contractor's integrated system and procedures planned for operations reflect the actual system as built and utilized. All the facilities that support the mission, this includes the launch control center, the mission control center, their launch pads and other systems will be assessed to demonstrate that they are ready for repeated operations. In addition, this review will demonstrate that their plans, procedures, and training for our astronauts and other key folks for regular and contingency operations have been completed before we fly. 
A certification review is a culmination of all the work to that point. Through this review, NASA will determine that the system has met NASA's safety and performance requirements to carry humans into low Earth orbit, specifically NASA crews to the International Space Station. So it's important to note that these systems will carry four crew members to the International Space Station once they are certified. This means we can double the amount of scientific research performed on the station today. We'll also be able to return powered cargo with our crews and retrieve, uh, retrieve critical science within two hours of landing. This is huge for researchers here in the U.S. who are working on time-sensitive science investigations. We have seen significant advances since we began our research on the station. I can't wait to see what else we'll learn and how it will benefit us here on Earth as we prepare to travel beyond low Earth orbit. So at this time, I will open up the floor to questions. Um, and we said it before, but I'm going to emphasize it again. Please keep in mind that we will not be able to address contract details or questions about the decision-making process during the ongoing procurement process. I do encourage you to reach out to Boeing and SpaceX to learn more about their systems and their plans forward. This is a really exciting time for them, and I know they're out there eager to share details with you. This is their time to brag now. They're even more eager to begin working on this contract and a new capability for this country. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star then one. Please remember to unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted, along with your affiliation. If you'd like to withdraw your question, you may press star 2. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1. Our first question comes from Alan Boyle, NBC News. Your line is open. I wanted to ask about uh, the uh, two to six flights that uh, that would follow that initial test flight. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the time frame for those flights and uh, what would be involved, how, how you decide how many flights there would be uh, and uh, what, uh, what the plan might be for going forward with additional contracts as uh, space station operations kind of go into the future, I, I don't know, in, into uh, 2019, 2020, perhaps beyond. Thank you. So um, the requirement on the contract was um, that the post-certification missions occur after we are done with certification. Um, you know, first of all, we have to ensure that the capability meets our safety and performance requirements before we actually start doing our services missions to the International Space Station. So those post-certification missions are really the station servicing missions. Um, so those missions, what they will be doing is they'll be launching our crews to the National Space Station. They'll be serving the lifeboat function. We talked about that. Basically, they're acting as the emergency vehicle during the, the crew's duration on orbit so that if any point there's an issue, they can still come back and safely return to Earth. And, and typically, the increment durations are about 180 days, and so the spacecraft has to serve that lifeboat function while the crew is on orbit. And then the vehicle brings the crew safely back. And so there will be at least a minimum of two missions um, awarded to each, of, to each of the providers and a maximum of six missions awarded to each of the providers through the duration of the contract. And we'll be making the decisions incrementally through the contract as, as we determine kind of the needs of the space station, and then we'll be basically issuing task orders for the missions as, they're, as, they're, as the companies are progressing along. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kevin Chang with New York Times. Your line is open. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I was trying to understand, does Boeing get paid the $4.2 billion, SpaceX 2.6, whether they fly two flights or six flights? And I was doing rough math of 2.6 billion divided by 12 flights, and I came up with like 108 million per seat. And obviously, that's divided between development and and the actual flights. But could you give a better idea how that's split apart? So um, the contract value that I stated was made up of the overall cost of the you know certification process, plus the cost of six missions, 
plus the a certain amount of contract value for special studies. So it's all that content that's in the $4.2 billion for Boeing and the $2.6 billion for SpaceX. Thank you. Our next question comes from Greg Avery with Denver Business Journal. Your line is open. Thank you. I, I, uh, the, the, funk, the video broke up a little bit toward the end. I don't know if you covered this, but can you explain a little bit about how Sierra Nevada um, lost out in this final cut? You know, um, we're not going to be able to comment on any of the offers. Um, what we can say is that we had uh, multiple companies that provided us, you know, good proposals, and the source selection official had to weigh the proposals against the criteria and the RFP and determine which uh, proposals we were going to award to based on what which provided the best value to the government. Thank you. Our next question comes from Nail Green Boys with National Public Radio. Your line is open. Oh, hey. Um, thanks for taking my questions. Could you just clarify, um, is the um, crude test flight a part of the certification process, or does that come after the safety certification process? And I'm wondering if those flights um, are expected in 2017 for both companies. And then I also wondered if you could say how many different proposals you all received to pick these two. Okay, so... Um let me let me uh, go through each of the questions. So the first question was, how does the uh, crude flight fit in with certification? Under the RFP, we required the providers to um, do at least one crude demonstration flight to the ISS. It's kind of similar to, you know, when you go and buy a car, you do a test drive of the car prior to you actually using that, you know, for the long term. And so it's, it's part of the certification process. So before they're certified, they have to do a demonstration mission, okay? Um, the second question was about, I'm sorry, were you, I'm sorry, can you? Um, Could, are you expecting safety certification, they have to do a crude test flight. Yes. Are, are you all expecting those test flights then by 2017? Okay, so it, within the RFP, we had a goal for certification by 2017. And so, the, as I explained before, the crude test flight is, is one of the activities that has to be done as part of that certification. So, you know, obviously we're committed to that goal. We have plans from the providers to be able to meet that goal. But as I talked about a little bit in the news conference, you know, as we work through this, we're not going to sacrifice crew safety for that goal. And then the final one was about can I say how many offers there were? And I and honestly, as we talked about before, I can't talk about um, the selection process or the procurement process at this stage. You know, because of where we are in the procurement process, um, that information, you know, we still haven't even debriefed the offers yet. And so any information that can come out will be coming out at the appropriate time. Thank you. Our next question comes from Steele Wilhelm with a Pute Senate Business Journal. Your line is open. Uh, thank you for taking this. Um, well, I want to ask you two quick things. One is, why is the Boeing contract so much larger than SpaceX's? What, what, what are you getting more from them, or are you getting anything different? And also, why did you do two selections when, I guess, people expected one, one was going to win? So we basically awarded based on the proposals that we were given. So um, we both contracts have the same requirement set, and the companies propose the value within which they were able to do the work, and the government accepted that. Um, you know, the, the source selection was made based on the criteria in the RFP and the proposals that were given. And the source selection official, after assessing the proposals and and, and having them evaluated against the criteria, determined that two awards was in the best interest of the government. Thank you. Our next question comes from Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Your line is open. With regards to the 
the test flight that's under the certification. Um, you mentioned that one NASA astronaut has to be on that crew. Is there a requirement for how large that crew has to be? And are there any other requirements about the length of that mission, given that you're um, certifying it as a lifeboat, and any other requirements for the test flight itself that you can share? So NASA's requirement for the test flight was that they had to demonstrate their their capability, the key aspects of their capability. And so for us, that typically means that they're launching, that they're um, demonstrating that their system can rendezvous and dock to the International Space Station, that it can be on orbit for a period of time to kind of check out the system, and then that it returns our crew safely home. We did not have a criteria for that crew under our requirements. We just required that it have NASA crew on the vehicle. And the duration is really dependent on how long it takes for them to be able to check out their system. So the offers were able to propose their strategy for that. Thank you. Our next question comes from Keith Cowan with NASAWatch.com. Your line is open. Okay, I'm going to try the same question everybody else has asked. Uh, Boeing's getting $4.2 billion, SpaceX gets 2.6. It's a difference of uh, 1.6 billion. You've described both contractors as pretty much doing the same thing. So uh, I'm still a little baffled as to why Boeing gets so much more. Is Boeing much more expensive to do the same work, or, or is it that SpaceX is cheaper? Well, I think, you know, it, um, I'm not going to, like I talked about before, Keith, I said I'm not going to be able to talk too much about the content of the the proposals or the or the contracts at this stage. I will tell you that the requirements for the contracts were consistent and were stated out there in the RFP that had been issued last November. Our next question comes from Mike Wall with Space.com. Your line is open. Okay, hi guys. Thanks again for uh, for actually doing this. I just wanted to to like just confirm something. I mean, is this like the official end of the road then for for both? I mean, Sierra Nevada and also Blue Origin. I mean, is there no that there's no capability to do like any unfunded Space Act agreements going forward for them? This this sort of severs ties with them with the commercial crew program. I just wanted to to actually confirm that that's true. So we are absolutely committed to our agreements under both CCI CAP and under CCDEV2. Under CCI CAP, we still have partnerships that have milestones. Both Sierra and SpaceX still have milestones under that those SAAs, and we're committed to continuing to work with them as they mature their capability. We feel it's very important for commercial industry and overall to continue to mature their capabilities. In addition, we, we also have... Uh, a relationship with uh, Blue Origin under their continued unfunded SAA, and and um, we are continuing that relationship and supporting them, them through their development process, too. We honestly, as a program, we gain a lot of um, benefit from us continuing to work with different solutions and keeping our kind of fingers on the pulse of industry out there because it continues to provide us with innovative and new ways for us to be able to do business too. Thank you. Our next question comes from Julie Johnson with Bloomberg. Your line is open. Oh, hi. So just to follow up on the last question, um, we know uh, Boeing and SpaceX have the first six ISS missions. Um, beyond that point, could they potentially be opened up to Blue Origins and, and SNC? So I'm glad you asked that question. You know, the, the contract actually has an on-ramp clause that allows us to um, look at um, potentially adding capability at, at some future time. But, but honestly, we also know that there's a potential for a services mission. I know folks have talked about station extension, and if there is a station extension out to 2028, we'll be looking at a crew services contract in the out year. So having multiple systems out there working really is, is beneficial to us. And as industry matures and there's capabilities and even new capabilities out there, you know, we're hoping that those capabilities provide us new uh, crew services 
and even potentially more safe, reliable, and cost-effective services in the future. Okay. The next question comes from Marcia Dunn with Associated Press. Your line is open. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm wondering, um, I've, I've heard mention up to four, you know, as many as four astronauts, and I know the Dragon is capable of carrying seven to the space station. Um, is there any reason why NASA is limiting the um, crew size to four? Well, our requirements were for four crew members to the International Space Station. So that was, that was NASA's requirement, and, and that's really what our, our current, you know, complement and um, science portfolio is based on. Okay, so that might go up in the future then you're saying? Well, I really right now I think, you know, we put our requirements out for how we're planning on using the, the vehicle. Um, if those requirements change in the future, then we'd update our requirements and, and have those out for industry to be able to go look at. Thank you. Our next question comes from James Dean with the floor today. Your line is open. Well, uh, thanks. Um, Kathy, can, can you boil these contract award amounts down to a price per seed, and does it represent a significant value compared to what we're now paying for Soyuz or the same or even more? So the, you know, the, the information we can give you is the total contract value, and so you just have to Right now, the content of that is for the full development cost, the cost of the six missions, plus the special studies. Now, what I what I do want, and we touched on it, we touched on it a couple of different times, is I do want to emphasize that for that contract value, we are getting the fourth crew seat. In addition, we're getting the additional mid-deck lockers, which really enable us to be able to fly up time critical cargo both up to and return it back to the station. And then we're also getting a capability that's launching from and returning to U.S. soil, which provides a huge benefit for us. So I, I just want to emphasize that the commercial crew capability was established and, and was based on us really, um, you know, pushing the ability to do research on the International Space Station through doubling up the crew capability on orbit and the crew time on orbit to be able to do science and providing the additional time critical transportation capability. Thank you. And our next question comes from Michael Belfry with Popular Mechanics. Your line is open. Hey there. I just wanted to find out if there was a timeline for the certification milestones or it, you know, is there a time limit by which they must be completed, or if it goes beyond 2017, is, is there the capability for that to happen? So 2017 is a goal, right? And so right now we have plans from all of our providers to be able to accomplish certification by that goal. But it was not a um, requirement in the in the contract or that if they didn't accomplish it by 2017, that for some reason the, the contract would expire. So uh, we currently have plans and we have uh, credible schedules within their plans to be able to get certified by 2017. But like I said before, you know, we're, we're not going to sacrifice crew safety for that goal. So we're going to methodically be working with our partners as we move forward and make sure that, that their systems prove that they can, you know, perform to the safety requirements that we have and the performance requirements that we have out there prior to being certified. Thank you. The next question comes from Frank Morin with Aviation Week. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. I may have missed the, the video feed, Died. Could you uh, um, repeat the answer that Charlie Bolden gave about the continuing resolution? How does the funding levels that you receive drive the uh, performance of these contracts? And also, um, I'm not clear, did the contracts, sorry? We'll make sure we get you a transcript of what Charlie said. 
Okay, then let me let me ask um, about the duration of the contract. Is it until 2024 or 28 or what? And also, if you could give us a little bit on those special studies that are included in the the total amounts. Thank you. You know, I'm gonna I'm we'll take that question because I don't want to give you a, a wrong. I'll have to look at off the top of my head. I don't remember what the period of performance was for the contract. Okay, so there's a period of performance within which we can order missions. And so, Frank, let us get back with you on that one. I should have had my contract person sitting in here. This is what happens when you let the program manager talk. So, <laughs> The next question comes from Tim Furholz with Course. Your line is open. Uh, hello there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, when is going to be the appropriate time to ask about the details of the contracts and the disparity? I have the same question everyone else has. At, at what point will you be able to talk about that information? My second question is, uh, I know there was some concern about Boeing's reliance on Russian parts for its rocket engines. Was that part of the consideration when awarding these contracts? Okay. Um, so, you know, we're still at the beginning of our post-award. I mean, we just awarded today. So what I'd say is we still need to go and um, debrief the offer and go through that period, and then we'll be starting to provide additional information at the appropriate time. Um, the second part is so we, um, you know, when we when we asked for uh, proposals, we were asking for an integrated uh, transportation system. And, and as part of that integrated crew transportation system and as offers put together proposals, we also asked them to address uh, the risk mitigations with their particular concept and, and proposed crew transportation system. So all the offers have provided um, risk mitigation plans for their particular um, transportation capability, and we're confident that with those risk mitigations, we have strategies to be able to deliver safe, reliable crew transportation capability to the International Space Station. Thank you. Our next question comes from Irene Klotz with Reuters. Your line is open. Um, Kathy, what's the effective start date on these contracts, and um, is there an option at all for um, extending the CCI cap um, for Sierra Nevada to continue work, or if they do continue work um, with NASA under Dream Chaser, would it be in an unfunded um, arrangement? Thanks. So I would say the start date's now, <laughs> you know, immediately. I Tell them why, what are they waiting around for? I'm sure they're all off working um, furiously already, Irene. Um, you know, we've honestly, um, with all of our essays, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, we still have a relationship with Blue Origin, we've offered up that at the completion of the funded milestones, if companies still wanted to work for us, and it was still within the scope, their initial scope of their um, SA award, that um, we, we've offered up their ability to continue to do that. Um, we've offered that with every single partnership that we've had. Thank you. Our next question comes from Dan Leone with Space News. Your line is open. Uh, hi, Kathy. I have two questions for you, just points of clarity from some things you said earlier. At the beginning of the call, you said that you, you couldn't discuss contract and bid specifics because it was an ongoing procurement. Is this procurement really still ongoing, or did you misspeak there? And the second question is, will NASA release the source selection document for this procurement? Thanks. So we're still in the process, right, after post-award. I mean, there's still... There's still uh, um, activities that need to happen to complete the procurement. And so in, so an example of that is the uh, debriefs that I talked about before. That all the offers we, we, per the federal acquisition regulations, they have the opportunity to be debriefed. And so that's offered up to all the offers. And so we're still in the process of working 
in doing that. So that's just an example of one of the things that are still going on. Um, the uh, source selection statement, um, you know, as we go through this process, we'll be releasing the source selection statement or, or at the appropriate time, more information will be coming out. Um, I do not have a timeline for that right now. Thank you. And the next question comes from Marcia Smith with SpacePolicyOnline.com. Your line is open. Thank you very much. Kathy, could you just go through one more time what the components of the contracts are? I had written down that it was partially for certification, partially for demonstration flights, and partially for special studies. And so what percentage is for each of those, and what are special studies? So, so I, would, I would tell you that... Um, the big chunk, I mean, with the, the lion's share of the work over the next few years is what we call certification. And certification is really what um, it takes to be able to have the providers show us that their systems meet our requirements. So it's when I was talking about the testing and the, product, you know, building the system, testing it, showing us, um, analyzing the system, all the things that we need to do to prove that that system meets our safety and um, performance requirements is, is key for, um, for certification. Now, part of certification is that demonstration mission that I talked about. So they're going to, we are having all these milestone reviews that are going through that certification process that, that kind of demonstrate the incremental progress that the that the providers have given us as they work through and are proving to us that their systems are going to do what they say they're going to do. And then we do a demonstration mission. And when after the demonstration mission, we will go and look at all the data and the performance data and everything else, and that culminates in a certification review. Once the provider is certified, then we begin the services mission, which that's what we're calling the post-certification mission. We didn't come up with a really cool name. We we just said these are the missions that occur post certification. <laughs> so those are really the services missions then that go through and deliver our crews and perform that lifeboat function to the International Space Station. So those are the two major components. The special studies feature that I talked about is really for small additional amounts of work that may be in addition, like an additional potential test that only NASA wants somebody to run, or an additional set of, of analysis. Or sometimes what happens is as you go through the, the contract process, there may be something that we didn't think about at the beginning in the development of the RFP that at that point we, we want to add a, a sufficient uh, additional test or a piece of it. And so the contract has the ability to do a a small amount of that work there, too. Thank you. And the next question comes from Camille Carlisle with Sky and Telescope. Our next question comes from Daniel Sokolov with Highs Publishing Group. Your line is open. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the question. Um, I would like to know about the budgetary uh, situation there. It was mentioned in the, in the televised conference that uh, the contract also depends on uh, Congress giving you the money. Can you, can you explain what the situation and how much incremental budget NASA would need in the coming years to actually be able to, to pay for these contracts? Thank you. So we're, we're, our plan to execute the contract is per the proposed budget as outlined in the 2015 NASA request. And uh, how? We'll take one last question. Yes, our next question comes from Charles Lorio with the Lorio Report. Your line is open. Yeah, hi. I lost a bit of the audio there for a moment. I don't know if that was uh, <laughs> universal or just at this end, but um, what I was going to ask is uh, uh, sort of a, a, another variant you probably can't answer, but 
anyway, uh, in regard to the uh, the budget situation, and that is really what it comes down. Let me try to put it this way: uh, How long and how uh, are you committed to maintaining the two contractor the two contractors? Is there any circumstance under which you would um, feel that you are, uh, because of a combination of low budgets and, and, and time pressure, obliged to uh, pull back to a single contractor? So, you know, we're, we're executing our plan to that five-year budget. And I just want to say that, you know, right now we're confident that our providers will be able to execute to the, the plans and the schedules that they have in front of them. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss the return of human spaceflight to the United States. It's an exciting day for all of us. If you'd like to listen to a replay of this teleconference, you can do so until October 15th by dialing toll-free 866-385-0194. The passcode is CREW2739. Again, that phone number is 866 866- Three eight five zero one nine four, and the passcode is crew C R E W or two seven three nine on your touch tone phone. Uh, we look forward to having uh, continuing this dialogue and seeing what happens with our first flights from the U.S. Thank you, and that concludes today's conference. All parties may disconnect at this time. <laughs>